The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. Game theory has been an important tool in American foreign policy since the 1950s. With both successes and failures in Eastern Europe, Korea, and Vietnam, what lessons have we learned from its use, and how can it help us in the present geopolitical climate? To find out, Policy Watch is joined by Tom Schelling, 2005 Nobel Laureate in Economics and Distinguished University Professor at the University of Maryland. And now, the host of Policy Watch, Doug Besherov. Tom Schelling. Welcome to the University of, I shouldn't say welcome to the University of Maryland because you've been teaching here for 15 years. Well, thank you for being on Policy Watch with us today. Thank you for letting me. And congratulations for winning the Nobel Prize in Economics. That's the 2,755th congratulation I've received, and I don't need any more. Well, it was probably one of the most sincere, and we'll let it go at that. Uh, I decided, regardless of what you were going to say, I was going to read the first three sentences of uh, what the Nobel Committee said, because it describes your contribution. And then I'm going to ask you to explain what game theory is uh, in less than three hours. Uh, and this is what the Nobel Prize Committee said. Uh, against the backdrop of the nuclear arms race in the 1950s, Thomas Schelling's book, The Strategy of Conflict, set forth his vision of game theory as a unifying framework for the social sciences. Schelling showed that a party can strengthen its position by overtly worsening its own options, that the capability to retaliate can be more useful than the ability to resist an attack and that uncertain retaliation is more credible and more efficient than certain retaliation. And the committee continued, Schelling's work prompted new developments in game theory and accelerated its use and application throughout the social sciences. And we'll try to talk about all of that. But first, as I warned you, I was going to ask, so what is game theory? Game theory, Doug, is merely the study of how rational people interact when they know that their decisions impinge on each other, when people have to anticipate what another will do or what another is already doing, or when people try to influence the choices of others through threats and promises and various devices to, make, to change their expectations of how one will behave. Now, most game theorists would say it's the mathematical analysis of those situations. By that definition, I'm not a game theorist. I use elementary game theory, but I'm basically a social scientist. So it's something like, I think if I do this, the other party to this transaction, let's call it a transaction, has the following options, and I think that party will do A, B, or C, and this is how I think I will respond? Yeah, but that, that would show up in, in a game like chess. Uh, most game theory, the, the name comes from games like chess, but most game theory went well beyond what they call zero-sum games, which are games of pure opposition, and became situations in which there is both conflict and a need for cooperation to avoid disastrous outcomes. And let's talk about the conflict side first. And I think, uh, and let's start with the concept of pre-commitment. Uh, the Nobel Committee talked about how one party can strengthen its position by weakening its position, or at least Well, by eliminating some options. Options. Yeah. Uh, back uh, early in the Kennedy administration, the Defense Department was interested in maximizing the options available. But I think one thing that game theory suggests is that very often eliminating certain options will affect the expectations of the other party about how you may react. I'll give you an example. In 1949, President Truman wanted Congress to authorize sending about 300,000 American troops to Europe to help begin the NATO buildup of military force. And the Congress asked Dean Natchison, the Secretary of State, what can 300,000 American troops do against two or three million Soviet and East German and Polish troops? And Dean Natchison's answer was, 
they can threaten to die. And the Soviets will know that if they either kill or capture 300,000 American soldiers, including some of their families, the war can't stop there. It is bound to go nuclear. This is the famous tripwire. Yeah. Now, this is, of course, not the first time in history that something like that happened. I remember my, I think it's my elementary school history. Didn't Cortez do something like the same thing before he invaded Mexico? He burned his boats so that his men had no choice but to move forward. I think even in the Iliad, boats were burned in order, well, for two reasons. One, to make the enemy realize we can never retreat. The other is to make all the soldiers on your side know that your buddies are bound to be with you because they have no place else to go. When we were doing this, what do you suppose the Soviets were thinking? Were, were they thinking in the same terms about our commitment and our pre-commitment to uh, our men being there? Oh, I, 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 not, not just in 1949 when Truman wanted authority to send the troops to Europe, but all during the time when Berlin was merely an outpost with 12,000 Western troops, American, British, and French, surrounded by an East German army and threatened by a Soviet army. All that time, the question was, how can 12,000 Western troops or 7,000 Americans defend Berlin? And again, the answer, in fact, this is one I explained to uh, President Kennedy's national security advisor, what they're really doing is they're threatening to die. And if they are overrun and killed or captured, the Soviets know it can't stop there. Do you think it would have not stopped there if they had done that? Would an American president, would, if, if the choice were 7,000 dead Americans, do you think an American president would have started the Third World War? I'm not sure he would have had to start a Third World War. And I'm not sure the Soviets had any, any good idea of what his options were other than starting a, an intercontinental war. And I think Part, part of the, uh, the effectiveness of those troops in Berlin was the Soviets couldn't really perceive what might happen, and they couldn't be sure that a U.S. president wouldn't do something foolhardy like starting a Third World War. After all, at the, in 1950, I think nobody really anticipated that the president of the United States would use American troops who were already in South Korea helping to train South Korean soldiers. Nobody could anticipate that President Truman would commit the United States to defend South Korea. They had all kinds of evidence that he wouldn't, but he surprised them. He did. And I think that had the good effect of suggesting to the Soviet Union, you can't count on the American president not to do something you didn't expect. And in fact, about that Korea, the South Korean invasion, uh, there are many people who think that if Dean Acheson and the president had declared South Korea part of the American sphere of protection, that there wouldn't have been an invasion in the first place? Well, there, there was a conjecture that D Dean Acheson, the Secretary of State, had, had made a very strong public statement defining what he called the American security perimeter, and it excluded South Korea. What he neglected to say was that the United States was committed to South Korea not to defend the United States, but as a matter of commitment. And apparently this is what Harry Truman felt was a genuine, either a genuine commitment for the sake of the South Koreans or a necessary stage to persuade the Soviet Union that they can't encourage countries like North Korea to carry out an aggressive attack. Now, this aspect of game theory requires the ability to have some communication with the other side, whether it's overt or indirect. So this is, in effect, a failure of the communica our communication to the other side. Could have been, but even a worse communication. The, the Chinese were trying, this has been documented, the Chinese were trying very hard to tell the United States that if General MacArthur let U.S. troops get very close to the Chinese border, they would have to intervene. And apparently, either they didn't communicate well or the Americans didn't listen well, because as you know, we went up toward the Yalu River and the Chinese came in in great numbers. Why they came in by surprise, I don't know. They should have come in more openly because then MacArthur might have stopped his march north. 
But anyway, there was a case of miscommunication on their part. I'm, I'm sure if we had known they would intervene, we would have stopped north of Pyongyang, drawn a line across the narrow waste of Korea, had almost all of Korea on our side, and that would have avoided Many the worst part of the of war. The worst part, because the first part, we, we took back that part of South Korea much more easily than the oh, rest oh, of the Oh, world. We, we, we took back all of South Korea with, with I, I think there were more than 1,000 or 2,000 U.S. casualties. Eventually, there were 40-some 40, 40 thousand casualties. Now, we shouldn't leave the topic of the Cold War without um, describing or discussing what I think were your misgivings about how some of that got implemented. Um, uh, you and I have talked before the show about the trigger nature, the hair trigger nature of our retaliatory um, uh, tools and the fact that maybe we went a little far in pre-commitment. Is that right? Here's where this question of conflict and cooperation comes in. The important thing all during the Cold War was for the United States to try to make clear that we would never initiate nuclear war except possibly if we had evidence that the Soviets were just about to start a nuclear war. That was called the preemption strategy. The, it's equally important to be able to convey to the other side, if you don't misbehave, we won't start a war. That means you have to threaten to retaliate or to preempt, but promise, not gratuitously, to start the war. It's like a blackmailer. He says, uh, you know, I've, I've, I'll, I'll threaten to expose you if you don't give me money, but I have to be able to promise that after you give me the money, I won't come back for more. And I think this combination of the threat and the promise uh, was an important part of the East-West confrontation. Now, in fact, your, I don't know if it was your only brush with Hollywood, but one of your brushes with Hollywood involved trying to picture a time in which there would be a deliberate initiation of a nuclear war. And I think this was because, during your involvement in the uh, planning for Dr. Strangelove and Stanley Kubrick. And am I correct that you all were unable to come up with a scenario where someone would be between us and the Russians where one side would deliberately start a nuclear war? Well, the original book on which Strangelove was based took place in uh, 19... 57, when there were no intercontinental missiles. It was all airplanes. The old B-36s, I think. No, I think by then we had B-47s and B-52s. Yeah, and a wing commander, believing that war was inevitable and it was better to get it started on our side, thought that if he could get a wing of B-52s flying over the Soviet Union ready to go to war, he could then tell the president, war is bound to begin in a few hours you'd better authorize the release of all the rest of the Strategic Air Command. Uh, this was very plausible. Uh, I got connected with it because I, I wrote something reviewing some books, and I reviewed that book, and Stanley Kubrick read a, a, uh, a reprint of my article that occurred in the Observer of London. He got in touch with the author of Red Alert, which was the American title of the book, got the uh, the author came to the United States to work on a screenplay, and we spent several hours trying to figure out how we get the same thing going in the missile age, and we couldn't. So Stanley Kubrick decided he'd make it what he called a nightmare fantasy. Because you could not picture, you couldn't envision how it would otherwise happen. That's right. yeah. You were also involved less happily and less successfully in thinking about the Vietnam War and uh, the initial thinking about Rolling Thunder and the ideas about bombing North Vietnam as a signal that we were serious about defending South Vietnam. I had only one conversation with anybody in the U.S. government on the bombing of North Vietnam. The proposal was, could we initiate a bombing campaign with the announced purpose of keeping it up unless North Vietnam ceased giving aid to the Viet Cong. The aid they were giving was intelligence, providing them uh, rehabilitation in the north, providing them ammunition, and the issue was whether the, the United States could briefly 
bomb in order to induce North Vietnam to quit aiding the Viet Cong. And I said, how quickly do you want that to happen? And the person I was speaking with said, two months maximum. I said, if North Vietnam stopped aiding the Viet Cong, how long would it take you to know the difference? And the answer was, maybe six months. I said, well, you can't very well start something that will terminate in two months after you have seen something that you can't see for six months. It won't work. They unwisely did not listen to you. Or they listened to me and didn't take me seriously. <laughs> Could we have sent a different kind of signal then to the North Vietnamese? I don't know. I, th I think in the end the North Vietnamese... You see, Lyndon Johnson publicly made this war a test of whether the United States would steadfastly maintain its commitments. His national security advisor told me that they considered the 17th parallel to be the equivalent of the Potsdam Resolution about east-west in Europe, and that if we didn't hold firm at the 17th parallel, which divided North and South Vietnam, that in Greece they would be afraid that the Bulgarians would attack, in Berlin they would be afraid that the East Germans would attack, and therefore this was a real test of whether the United States maintained its commitments. Meanwhile, Ho Chi Minh on the North Vietnamese side was saying, this is a test of whether some small, brown, underdeveloped, patriotic Vietnamese can stand up against a rich, fat, white military power. And the, between the two of them, it became a moral issue. And, and once it becomes a moral issue, it's very hard for anybody to back down. Some have said that same mismatch between the North Vietnamese and the American forces um, was present during the American Revolutionary War, where we were, in effect, a small ragtag group. Now, we did have the help of the French, but we were fighting the world's greatest military power at the time. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what lesson we can draw from that, mm -hmm. Ex except that... Uh, well, small guys can the, sometimes beat big The weaker big side guys. Can, can sometimes have enough stamina and determination. One worries that, I know this is not science, but one worries that um, this same big guy, little guy, might be happening in Iraq right now. Yeah, but you see, in, in, in Vietnam, I think the mistake that the U.S. made was to think that this was part of the Cold War. This was part of a Moscow-Beijing-Hanoi axis. I don't think the North Vietnamese had any notion that they were tools of the Soviet Union or tools of the Chinese. They despised the Chinese. They certainly weren't involved with the Chinese. They had a war with them within 10 years, oh, yeah, if I remember. Yeah. And, and, and the, the Soviets did provide material by railroad car through China. China let it go through. But the funny thing is, during that war, when, when everybody was thinking that U.S. planes getting within 10 miles of the Chinese border would provoke a Chinese entry, uh, relations between the U.S. and China and relations between the U.S. and the Soviet Union steadily improved. You know, the war was going on. The, the Soviets had Soviet military personnel helping North Vietnamese anti-aircraft batteries, but they didn't wear uniforms. And as a result, if we bombed them, the Soviets didn't have to acknowledge that we had bombed anybody in a Soviet uniform. And, uh, and the Americans flew so many sorties near the Chinese border uh, that, that I think there were literally hundreds of border crossings by American planes, and all the Chinese did was invite Richard Nixon to go and <laughs> visit China. Well, so in that context, was there a way for us to, as they used to say, peace with honor? Was there any way to leave except just to leave? I think in the end we left without honor, we could have left without honor several years earlier. But it was going to be without honor either way. 
Well, I think Lyndon Johnson decided that we could get out without his honor. He would let his successor do it. And his successor didn't take the opportunity. For more than 60 years, we haven't seen the wartime use of a nuclear weapon. But today we face more countries either having nuclear weapons or are apparently on the verge of having them. Let's talk a little bit about that. Before we talk about Iran and Korea, help us a little bit understand India and Pakistan. They both have nuclear weapons. I take it they both have the ability to strike the other country. What's going on there? Why do they have the weapons and why haven't they used them? The difference between India and Pakistan on the one side and let us say Iran or North Korea on the other. Indians and Pakistanis have been attending all kinds of conferences and discussions with people from the West. They've been going to Aspen, Colorado to talk about arms control and nuclear policy with Japanese and Germans and French and Norwegians and Americans and Italians. English is a native language to most of them. They're just as sophisticated as most Americans or British or Germans or Japanese are about nuclear weapons, what they're good for, what they're bad for, what responsibilities they bring, what problems they can bring. And I tend to think that Indians and Pakistanis who have been observing the, the Cold War confrontation between USA and USSR understand a little bit about how to make mutual deterrence work and how to avoid anything that may disturb a balance of terror. Uh, I think they also understand a lot about nuclear weapon safety, how to keep nuclear weapons in custody where they won't be stolen or misused or sabotaged and things of that sort. Well, now, this is what really worries me now. I read, India seems like a relatively stable country, relatively as these things go. But I, I get the feeling reading about Pakistan that the president, Musharraf, could be gone any day, a lucky bullet. I get the feeling that there are um, uh, Al-Qaeda or other rebels in various parts of the country. The government could collapse at some point. What happens to the weapons there? I don't know where their weapons are. I don't know whether they're in the custody of the army or an air force or whether in the vault of the central bank or whether there's a secret police group that has any nuclear weapons that Pakistan contains. Uh, I, I have a hunch that your interest in the question, what happens if there's a revolt, is what keeps Musharraf awake nights because he knows that in case of any kind of a revolt or a coup d'etat or a civil war or anything of the sort, everybody's going to want to find those nuclear weapons because whoever gets custody of them will have an immense influence on the outcome of whatever may be going on. We have to hope that Musharraf understands the danger of having some nuclear weapons somewhere in his country that will be the target of anybody who tries to overthrow the, the government. And if you were a betting man, I know you don't, but, and you can rule this question out of order, but if you were a betting man, wouldn't you bet that the U.S. government is watching where those, is trying to find out where those weapons are and has a plan B as well? I'd go farther than that. I would hope that the U.S. government is trying to find a way to talk to the Pac government of Pakistan about custodial arrangements for nuclear weapons, among other things to make sure that if they are ever captured, they can't be used. You see, we have, the U.S. has nuclear weapons, with, with, with a few exceptions, which I think are the nuclear submarines. The U.S. nuclear weapons, if somebody steals one, he can't make it go off. Furthermore, most U.S. weapons will, are designed so they will only go off at the target they were designed for. They have, a G, they have a GPS. If you have a weapon designed for St. Petersburg, if it's not St. Petersburg, it won't go off. And if it's designed to go off at 40,000 feet, if it's not at 40,000 feet, it won't go off. These are what you might call smart weapons. This is all since 
the middle 1960s. Until then, there were no combination locks on the weapons. There weren't even police dogs guarding them. Uh, in, in those years, there were bombs everywhere. Well, not everywhere, but there were... We had bombs in Greece when there was a military revolt that overthrew the government. We had bombs in Turkey when there was a military revolt that overthrew the government. The General Accounting Office even photographed jeeps with bombs on board where the driver was in having a cup of coffee somewhere. <laughs> that was before Secretary McNamara in 1961 got terribly concerned about bomb security and began to develop the system of electronic locks on all the weapons. Well, this is a tremendously reassuring conversation. Isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> um, it makes me feel good. <laughs> uh, in our next segment, we'll talk about um, what's happening uh, now Korea and Iran and so forth. But in the meantime, let me just say to our viewers, if they want to contact us, you can email us at policywatch.umd, that's UMD for University of Maryland, dot edu. And in the meantime, Tom Schelling, thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland.